Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at ATA. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Third Horizon Strategies, David Smith. Great, Eddie, thank you. Uh, thanks to those that, um, thanks to all of those who chose to spend a little bit of time with us uh, this afternoon as we talk a bit about the post-pandemic uh, landscape and some of what to expect next um, uh, in the healthcare industry. Uh, as Eddie said, I'm David Smith. I'm the CEO and founder of Third Horizon Strategies. And I wanna also just take a moment to express my appreciation to uh, the ATA for uh, convening this program, uh, an advanced appreciation for my two colleagues who I'll introduce in just a moment, and definitely appreciation to Health for um, their leadership, both on this subject and on a range of things. I also just have to take a moment uh, to thank Health uh, for, uh, for the brand new caricature I'm getting to enjoy on the slide. It was a few years ago, um, the first health conference, I'm descending the escalator in Las Vegas, and you're seeing all the advertisements with all these cool caricatures. And I thought to myself, I guess maybe like that's how, you know, you've arrived in our industry. It was when health does a caricature. And so it may have taken years and, and hundreds and hundreds of other caricatures, but I've arrived and, and I have one. So I doubly appreciate them not uh, capturing my post-pandemic body uh, and making me look much more like I did pre-pandemic. Uh, I want to start the conversation just by sharing a couple of data points. The part of the reason we've um, uh, convened around this subject is uh, the ATA uh, and the HFMA, the Healthcare Financial Management Association, came together late last year with a couple of other groups and uh, decided to ask the question, like, how did we do financially in the system during this time of, of uh, really uncommon duress? And if we were going to think about that in the context of a stress test, how well did our financial systems uh, uphold? And we all know there were some benefits we, we collectively derived uh, because of some federal supports, particularly the CARES Act last year. Nevertheless, um, we wanted to take a look at those questions. And so I thought I would just share some of the scenarios that we had developed out. I'm going to do this really quickly because I want to get to our colleagues and, and start with uh, the discussion. But Eddie, thank you. If you want to go to the next slide for me, um, there were basically two things we were trying to test here. Um, what will be the ultimate result uh, from the shifts we were seeing in utilization last year, which were obviously most acute in the March-April timeframe, and then any other attendant shifts in coverage we might see depending on how deep uh, a recession went, how many uh, beneficiary, how many enrolled individuals under a, a commercial plan would end up in Medicaid, and then what was the, the overall impact on uh, financial resources for hospitals under that those scenarios. And then we wanted to kind of overlay that and map that against the, the current assets of the general fund across hospitals um, throughout the country, all 5,000 hospitals. So we ran uh, a bunch of different scenarios here with varying levels of unemployment impact, varying, various levels of utilization impact, and though there's still a lot of data we don't have from Q4, Q1 uh, of this year, uh, we, we are starting to get a bit of a picture. We know unemployment did not get nearly as deep as, as many economists thought it might uh, in any contraction activity. And we know utilization did have an impact. We, we know we saw less people uh, in hospitals and primary care offices. We know we made a big shift uh, to telehealth in a lot of parts of the country. And so, we believe that the overall impact is somewhere between the 71.44 billion and uh, 194.53 billion, um, both of which account for the CARES Act money, the 150 billion or so that was uh, put out by the federal government last year. If you think about the impact on current assets, we can go to the next slide, Eddie. Uh, current assets, basically, or I'm sorry, the general fund. Um, which is essentially like the owner's equity version of a hospital balance sheet. Uh, those numbers kind of vary. And, and the most conservative of all scenarios, uh, you can say we may have wiped out about 8% of the wealth, the holdings um, outside of the assets uh, of hospital systems across the country. The more moderate uh, utilization impact example would say we lost about a fifth of it. Um, you can see at the bottom right that had things gotten really bad, 
um, we could have been you know, north of 30%, which is, which is quite significant uh, if you think about the impact in one year. If you look at this from the current asset perspective, and we can go to the next slide and, and the last one, um, we really uh, do have a little bit less clear of the picture. This basically represents cash, cash equivalents uh, on the balance sheets of health systems across the country. And, and we see that we're somewhere between this 15 to 40% uh, area where, um, where we've left uh, some, some big opportunities on, on more liquid uh, cash in some markets. Not going to be a big deal, um, particularly markets where uh, that impact was uh, lesser. And other markets, uh, if they had a more uh, significant impact as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we literally could, could see some important strategic implications that come out of a, of a big impact to the current asset or the general fund. And so these are the questions we're kind of wrestling with. And it's, it's the questions that uh, I think wanna, we want to set as the backdrop against um, what is our sentiment? What are our sentiments right now about the impact of the COVID-19 period? How did we try to control for that uh, utilization impact during the period? And what kinds of transformational things might we expect to, to occur as a result of that? So to help with that discussion, I have two uh, wonderful colleagues joining me, both of whom I, I know quite well. Um, the first is Deanna Larson. Uh, Deanna is the Chief Executive Officer for Avera eCare. And Avera eCare is a, a company that, that essentially focuses on transforming community care by introducing virtual solutions across uh, a bunch of uh, bio, biopsychosocial uh, domains. Uh, and the other is Joe Pfeiffer. Um, Joe Pfeiffer is the Chief Executive Officer of the Healthcare Financial Management Association. Uh, this is essentially an association <clears throat> whose members uh, are, are, deep in the, are steeped in the finances of healthcare. Uh, a lot of CFO, RevCycle, uh, and other uh, similar designations across the healthcare ecosystem. So Deanna and Joe, thank you so much for joining the discussion. Great to be here. Um, Joe, I want to go ahead and start with you, uh, if I can. And I, I want to maybe just pick up... Uh, uh, based on the slides I just shared, you and I have talked a lot about this over the last few months, and uh, maybe just start by opining a bit on uh, the state of the state as we come into the uh, as we come into June of 2021, and we're starting to get a little bit more data. Like, how bad was the financial impact? How uneven was it? And how are CFOs feeling right now? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, just to talk about where they are right now, I might just take a second to go back where we were a year ago, and it was simply amazing. Um, it was, you know, I, I think the word crisis gets overused in our society, but it was a literal financial free-for-all, <laughs> or free-fall, I should say. I mean, you know, they had to, you know, shut down scheduled procedures. Um, we all know about that. Uh, the cost of labor went up significantly. I mean, they were, you know, spending, you know, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars a week for travelers. Um, cost of supplies went way up, um, and uh, you know, it was just a again a, a, a massive uh, scramble to try to get supplies. Um, so, uh, but then all along come. Uh, uh, the CARES Act and all the, the the federal stimulus money, and that offset um, you know a lot of those costs, um, and which you know obviously, so that mitigated a tremendous amount of that financial strain last year. I give you that history. Everybody knows all that history, but there's a couple of those elements that continue on today. You know, the cost of labor is is a current and forecasted problem. Um, and it's, uh, we don't know the impact of all that yet. There's some fear that um, not only do the travelers continue, but also the fear that, you know, burnout and uh, people just, you know, tired of it, leaving the industry, uh, a number of concerns on the labor side uh, are going forward. And, and that's going to play out over the few next few months and years. The same thing with supply costs. Um, they are not at that peak level as they were a year ago. Um, but they're higher than they were before. And there's other costs embedded in retooling themselves that, um, you know, again, are the kinds of things that are going to continue forward. Your, your statement about the impact was not equal was, is absolutely true. 
there's a few health systems um, that weathered the storm better than others. Uh, some paid back their um, uh, their CARES Act money. I know, um, you know, one story I like to tell, and this is public information. I heard it from their CFO, Bill Rutherford, but HCA wrote a check back to federal government for six billion dollars and he said he had to actually had to it had to be a manual check he had to sign the check uh he said he'd never done anything like that before um most health systems kept their money because i needed it and it really did bail them out you know a moderate size health system of multi-hospital uh they were in the process of losing in excess of a hundred million a month and so um, most kept the money because it was necessary and they're still going through some of the accounting for all that. And then some health systems are, they did receive the money. They're still struggling. They continue to struggle uh, going forward today. I would say if you were to cast the entire hospital industry in one average element, I would say most have recovered back to their pre-pandemic or close to their pre-pandemic revenue levels and close to their pre-pandemic income levels. And the reason they're not at the pre-pandemic levels on the income side is um, some probably more permanent cost increases. Um, and then last thing I'll say is just going forward, I mentioned the costs. One thing we're still not 100% sure on what's gonna happen and that is what's gonna go happen with payer mix. As this economy continues on and the unemployment is what it is, you know, that's kind of a lagging indicator. There's a tail to that that has an impact. And so we're still waiting for a lot of that to uh, to play out. But I hope that answers your question. That is uh, that is what the CFOs are thinking about today. Yeah, it does. I almost passed out when you said HCA were the $6 billion check. Back so it was a great story. And he said it's not, it was one of the hardest things that he could, he said he couldn't even figure out how to get it to him. And, you know, because whoever, who does that, right? Uh, no, I, I remember how it felt to write my first $6 billion. <laughs> um, hard. Yeah. It, was, it, it was really it does, hard. Yeah, it doesn't get easier. It doesn't get, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> um, so I'll buy, for reference, everyone, I've never written a $6 billion check. Um, so Joe, let me ask you one other question. And Deanna, I want to I want to pivot to you. Um, I know one of the things we, we want to talk a bit about is how well we adapted to the environment as we went through this period. And um, we, of course, you know, entered as we really came into the second and third quarters, we were entering an environment where people were really just either they couldn't visit a, a healthcare facility or they were uncomfortable to visit a facility. And Joe, I'm, 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 from your perspective, how much uh, transitioning did you see uh, in telehealth? What were some of the things your CFO colleagues were thinking about in that transition? Uh, and then Deanne, I'm gonna piggyback off of his uh, response and, and have you. Yeah, you, you kind of cut out for a second, David. Are you talking about telehealth, the transition to telehealth? Correct, yes. Sir. Yeah, so that was one of the more fascinating things I've ever seen in my career. And, and again, and Joe, I'm not. Joe, I'm so sorry. I'm going to interrupt. Deanna, real quick, we're just getting a little background noise on your end. So if you want to mute for one moment for me, if you're able to, and then perfect. Thanks, Deanna. And we'll all do, we'll all police our mute buttons. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. You're, you just ruined my complete train of thought, David. And now I can't answer your question. <laughs> Ask it again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my career. And I'm not one prone to hyperbole because I've seen a lot over my years. And sometimes I just like, yeah, that might be a different name. And it's the same thing we've been seeing. And the reason I say that is, so I've been at HFMA for, for nine years. I remember talking about telehealth uh, when I was at Spectrum Health as the, health, the uh, uh, hospital group CFO. And by definition, that was more than nine years ago. It was probably 10 or 11 or 12 years ago. We were talking about telehealth. We were talking about, you know, different types of remote health. And so here we were, you know, again, 10, 12 years later, and the uptake of telehealth was pretty minimal in the industry. And I think pretty minimal, I would say absolutely minimal. In fact, we just did a, uh, our last, uh, HFM Magazine, we talked a lot about uh, telehealth. I can't remember if it was a story in there or we're just in part of doing our homework for that, but we talked to the folks and this is, I'll, I'll cite one health system, but this is so representative. We talked to Metro Health in Cleveland and before the pandemic, they were at um, less than 1% of their visits um, being virtual. And in less than a month, 
they trained 250 docs and they were over 75% of their visits were virtual. And now they've gotten that to a sustainable model. I have never in my career seen a transition so rapid. Most change in healthcare takes years and years and years. And again, that's why I started with my story about having talked about telehealth years ago in my CFO days. So it, it, was, um, it was fascinating. And so uh, the question then becomes, what happens now? I mean, it's, <clears throat> a lot of that is, was based on a temporary payment environment by CMS. And we don't know how long that will continue and what will happen after that. Um, you know, there were some temporary payment environments by the, by the private uh, sector. So how much of that will become permanent and, and how much not? The other thing, and this is bringing in a whole different topic to it, but I can't help but relate to this. We're wondering what's going to happen with telehealth because we continue to look at this on a fee-for-service payment methodology. You know, if we were in a, um, you know, a true value-based uh, risk assumption environment, you know, we, wouldn't, we, we would absolutely incorporate telehealth into the entire continuum of services that we would provide patients um, to keep them healthy. And we're worried about what's gonna happen with telehealth because it's paid on the fee for service basis. And then you get into um, you know, possible backsliding. Um, if payments go back to where they were, you know, are physicians and health systems gonna go back, wanna go back to the way it was? And um, again, if we had a different payment environment, we wouldn't even be talking about that because we'd be talking about how telehealth will be a perfect component into an, intent, an entire continuum of care um, you know, for patients, again, in a value-based payment model. So sorry for taking it in a different trajectory, but I, I can't help but think about how telehealth makes so much sense, but we struggle with it because of the fee-for-service payment environment. No, I think it's, it's a really important, really impression. De Deanna, let me, um, let me piggyback and tee up two questions for you. Um, I think the, the experience Joe described of seeing this massive uh, adoption wave that historically would have taken years uh, is pretty consistent with what I, I continue to hear and, and I think with the reality. Um, where did we do well in kind of that bubblegum and sticky tape transition and what did we not do so well? And I guess that, that'd be the first question. And then Deanna, the other question for you is kind of as we sit here in early June of 2021, are we starting that backsliding? Are, are we starting to kind of go, revert to the mean, this fee for service mean that, that Joe teed up and do you see anything that, that affects that? Yeah, great, great couple of questions. Really, uh, really appreciate that, David. And, and I want you to know I have not wrote a check even a fraction of that size. <laughs> but, um, there you go. I wouldn't know how to deliver. You haven't lived, it. Deanna. You haven't lived. I don't know how many zeros that is. So, <laughs> you know, um, you know, we we often hear this word about adoption of telemedicine, and I, one thing I want to make sure you know, that I've thought a lot about is, did we adopt it or was this just a critical event and there was so much demand? You know, we had physicians at home who couldn't go to the clinic, clinics were closed. We had patients who needed care and who were afraid to show up or couldn't show up because they couldn't get access, everything was closed. And so this, this big um, demand of need and care and physicians available, but you know, how do I really get myself out to my patients? So a lot of primary care physicians, internal medicine as well, specialists, really kind of clamoring, if you will, where do I work? How do I I'm part of this pandemic. I'm part of the resource that needs to be used, but how do I help? You know, that that does not forego that many of them signed up for shifts and participated in hospital or acute care as well. But remember, there was a, a large group of individuals who didn't have a clinic to go to. So demand, supply, all of that kind of all fed in. And so then the government said, hey, you can use any platform if it's compliant or not compliant, and you don't really need a license maybe. So all of those things fed into kind of what I call the Wild West, you know. Um, so physicians, I don't think I've ever been resistant to, you know, get it. Well, you know, I'm generalizing. Um, like, they're very adaptive people when new technology comes forward. 
how does this work for me? How does this work for the patient? How do I bill for this? How do insurance companies respond? So much of that was taken away. Um, so there was a, a big rush and you know we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the other details were. But I would say, first of all, that was really a demand situation and a lot of people wanting to be responsive to their patient clientele and what the needs were there. So they were you know, getting on a multitude of platforms, um, needing a lot of help and support with that, which again, we're going to talk about. But I, I do think um, that thrill of being our physicians and nurse practitioners and nurses wanting to respond to this big uh, demand and, and also, you know, remember that this kept them safer, let's just say in the acute care setting, um, they didn't have to go in and out of rooms, they didn't have to gown and, um, you know, use all the protective equipment to go in, they could go in and virtually round and see patients and support care. So all the way around um, this, this big um, tool set come in that they were aware of, but now there was a practical use case that really made a difference for them. So I think that adoption um, was natural, but there were issues, um, you know, along, and I think that's maybe coming up down the road. Um, so what was really important to them um, was that that access and being supportive. And then the, the second, what didn't go well was all of the, what I just said, they could get on any platform, which meant our tech people had to like know all the platforms they were on. And, and you know, it wasn't just the physicians, but how do I get scheduled on it? Oh, the patient doesn't know how to download an app. Um, they're on the round browser, they can't hear. How do you tell them if they're on an iPad or if they're on a different type of tablet or even a desktop, whatever it is, where's my volume? What browser do I need to be on to download this app? So again, that influx of demand for technical people or somewhat technical people to support both the physician or clinical side, as well as the consumer side, helping them get in. They wanted in, they wanted to help each other, but that backlog of you know how to get registered, how to download apps, that was tremendous. And so when uh, Joe talked about the number of physicians that were registered and could work on different platforms, that they didn't just pick up the phone and, well, in some cases they did just pick up the phone. We heard of some clinicians actually doing, you know, FaceTime and other kinds of things, which again was wave, you know, there was a waiver for that, for HIPAA compliance requirements by OIG for at least a set a period of time. You know, we just we were disconcerted as a health system about utilization of that. So we discouraged those things because most of us had other tool sets. But again, that clamoring to get on them was all, you know, it was, you know, really a rodeo show getting everybody in and also a big passion of health systems to respond to the needs that were, you know, really rising during the pandemic. So, um, you know, I, I think you said, you know, what's happening on the backside. Um, I think on the backside, larger entities, health systems are really understanding. So the acute care side, they became very dependent on community-based resources, hospitals, clinics, other things that could actually support them in a way that maybe when we talked about rural earlier, um, maybe they were used to most patients transferring at a certain acuity rate to into a tertiary or you know higher level of care. Well, now those beds are full, and so we're saying, what can be better maintained and supported in those organizations? What kind of help do you need? And oftentimes that was telehealth, um, telemedicine, video, or other types of consults that could occur to keep those patients in um, in a place that really gave great care, but maybe formally would have been transferred again into a bed in a tertiary facility that was now full. So there was a bigger um, respect, a different kind of um, pride that was actually taking care, taken up in some of those smaller community hospitals about what they were able to really support and they did a great job. And I think the tertiary facilities all in all, that ecosystem was a little better recognized in many situations. But that backslide, why is that gonna happen? You said, are we, are we, you know, did we peek out at most most health systems at thousands or tens of thousands more telehealth visits than what they'd ever had before? And again, I, they don't even really know the numbers in all honesty because they were on so many platforms. It's really hard to keep the count, right? Um, so, and some physicians were doing it on their own to take care of their patients. So really hard to know all that happened. Um, the other hard things were documentation and handoffs from one you know, telehealth system into the EMRs, all of that was difficult. And so, um, you know, backslide back into comfort, comfortable where all those systems are in place is really most 
for the most part in many health systems, brick and mortar. Oh, also, by the way, as you described, that's how they get paid. That's where the billing takes place. And they, they know that's, that's easier to do. Scheduling is easier to do in their typical um, system, administrative system support. So you, you think about that. Um, I don't think it's because physicians, and for sure consumers, uh, didn't take well to it. Um, consumers still want it. They're still demanding it. Many, many physicians want the opportunity to provide more telemedicine. So it's, it's mostly about the infrastructure that we have in place for reimbursement and our technology within our health systems. Yeah, well, I, I, that's actually a perfect segue, Dan. I want to ask you one other question. Um, if we were going to think about, you know, rating the infrastructure um, in a pre-pandemic and then, you know, where we are today, this, this slow exit out of the pandemic, and you were going to use just a, a letter grading scale, A, B, C, D, E, or F, and then mm -hmm. A is, you know, well-deployed, it's a recognized, well-used modality for care and an extension of our infrastructure, um, and F is like, we've got the technology, but we're just terrible at using it. Um, like where were we in 2019 and have we improved the grade at all over like now after the dust is settling? Yeah, tough question. And of course you'd find certain health systems that, you know, were very good. You know, if they were a C before they're a B or an A maybe going forward because they had the, um, the infrastructure in place. If they were not good before and they used whatever was quick to assemble, they might be in a worse spot today because they're trying to pull together um, now, um, you know, experiential situations by clinicians using a certain platform that they found, um, literally found and implemented. And now you're trying to, you know, kind of regather the herd, if you will, and get onto one platform. So, you know, I think um, we, if you can think about the EMR, there's still a lot of lack of integration. Um, of uh, telehealth, how um, synchronous and asynchrony uh, comes into an EMR or at least how information is shared. So workflow processes within health systems really need to support um, the physician and, uh, you know, the clinicians. What I would say to you uh, that's really, I, I think, important, David, is that we, we don't want to have clinicians who are used to walking into a room and you want to think about that in all of your own healthcare experience, you're set up for the clinician who's going to see you either for a healthy visit, a wellness visit, or an ill visit. You're either in a clinic setting, in a bed, and you're already, you know, gowned for that clinician to do the assessment, or you're in an ED bay and you're, you know, ready for the clinician to come in. You know, we, we can't expect a clinician to come in and, you know, dial in a video, set up the sound, put the video, you know, at the right trajectory and, you know, tell the patient to disrobe so they can see the rash that they want. You know, we, we need to be thoughtful about maximizing the clinician who's going to interact with a telehealth visit versus asking them to do all of that so that we're actually, in that case, in that second case, we're reducing their productivity. So I, I don't know that we are as good at really working um, through that workflow for a clinician to see a patient. And, you know, by the way, you know, after a physician does all of that, there's that's already taken part of their time with the patient. So I, I would say from infrastructure to even um, workflow, uh, we have a ways to go yet. Well, I, um, I, I think you're exactly right. You know, we've, um, we've held a few roundtables with clin uh, clinical leaders from health systems, health insurance companies, disruptors in the, in the industry. And one thing that came out of all of these roundtables that was pretty ubiquitous was um, we, we did not have supply side solutions ready to meet physicians, practitioners, and patients where they are. And, and because, because we're not integrated into the workflow, because there still is a difference between a physician walking into an exam room and getting online and everything from the scheduling to the appointment, to the documentation, uh, and everything in between. And um, there's, there's, I think, some health system, I'm going to use that broadly, culpability with that. But there's a lot of work our suppliers have to do to get better at that. One, one anecdote I'll just share with you before you go to the next question. I've been around long enough to know that there were some, you know, air, most physicians use um, 
uh, imaging, right? Now we call it imaging, we almost don't call it x-rays. But when we were transitioning um, from digital to digital, from film, you know, how long did we have to keep film rooms available, you know, to transition into digital? And that was because we didn't integrate it into the workflow. So we should learn a lesson from some of the past things that we've done to make sure we've worked that out for them. And, you know, you know they, they have, their time is valuable. So we have a lot of engineers who can come in and help um, really do that workflow for them. Some amazing anecdote, Deanna. Um, so Joe, I wanna, I wanna jump back um, a bit. We're kind of easing our way into this fee-for-service value tension you, you identified a few minutes ago. And I wanna just, I wanna ask a question that's one click above that and, and kind of putting back on your finance hat, which I understand would be the right hat for you. <laughs> Um, as you kind of think about the implications of the last 15 months, 16 months, what are some of the strategic things you, you believe health systems are thinking about? Do you think we'll see a different level of interest in M&A? Do you think there's, there's now a higher motivation to pursue value-based contracts um, or to divest of higher cost brick and mortar facilities and in advance of the next pandemic, you know, God willing, being far, far off. Like what, what, are, what are people in the industry thinking about right now with that finance cap on? Um, you know, I think there's a mixed bag on some of the examples he gave, like, you know, whether there's, you know, more M&A activity. I think you, you will see more. I think there's an, um, I, I would put that into the category of the pandemic being accelerant of an already existing uh, trend. The one thing I think maybe the pandemic has done is, uh, and I, this is also probably, um, you know, so much of this is it was an accelerant of existing trends, but I'm hearing more and more conversation about really intensifying the transition to uh, digitization of some type. And um, along the lines of, uh, you know, that, that would benefit the consumers. You know, there's a lot of outsiders that are generating solutions um, and the health systems themselves are doing that as well. You know, the rest of those things, I think you are going to see, again, I said it earlier, but I think you're going to see um, uh, an increase in mergers and acquisitions. Some places are just not going to be able to continue to make this investment. In terms of value-based payment, I, I, I'm here in a mixed bag. I think there's still hesitancy, and I think there's um, that falls back into this. It's human nature to stay with what you're comfortable with, and people are comfortable with fee for service. And as as a, as a finance person, I could say it's a lot easier to match your uh, expenses with your revenues. They can both go up and down. Uh, uh, much more synchronously on a fee-for-service payment environment. You, you put in a risk environment and all of a sudden that revenue is much more fixed and you're basically managing your expenses um, you know, in, a, in a different kind of way. And so there's a hesitancy still to move aggressively uh, into value-based payment. Now, again, there are pockets and organizations where that's different. And there's just like almost anything in healthcare, there's such a wide variety that it's it's hard to answer that. But that's, I guess that's how I would answer the question. And Joe, I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I just, I do want to make a linkage uh, between what you just said and what you said a few minutes ago and, and make sure I'm not misrepresenting it. Um, the, the, the sense is that, okay, so, so the, the financial impact of COVID-19 will, will be uneven across the country, and that might accelerate pre-existing trends around M&A divestiture, but it, it maybe didn't fundamentally change them. Uh, from your perspective, it doesn't seem to have structurally accelerated any kind of a, a transition to value. Um, and it, it may be part and parcel for that reason that the, the lingering adoption, I, by the way, Deanna loved your qualification of the word adoption, the lingering adoption of, of telehealth solutions um, certainly is not likely to keep pace with, with last year um, and may, may find a new baseline that's hopefully somewhere between 2019 and 2020. Am I characterizing that? How, how would you adjust what I just yeah, said? That, that's, uh, that's exactly right. I, and, you know, 
you, you wouldn't expect it, there was an immediate shutdown of so many services that all of a sudden that pendulum swung way to the side of uh, you know doing telehealth. Nobody reasonably expected that to stay the same. So the question is not will it change, but when that pendulum comes back, what's that new normal? Uh, another much overused word <laughs> over the last year. But what you know? What's that that centering point? And um, that's the part we don't know yet. And I, again, I think um, uh, I might differ a little bit with Deanna in terms of the acceptance of uh, of these different care models by physicians. I think that's again, I don't have any industry wide data, uh, so these are just anecdotes. But I'm starting to hear stories from the CFOs of physicians pushing to push you know as much back to the way it was before so I yeah I don't know gosh David it's really hard to answer the question but I think your summary of what I was trying to say is accurate um so so just for everyone's um knowledge I'm starting to see questions come in thank you please do submit those we're going to be getting to, to some of those here in a couple minutes um Deanna would love your kind of reaction to that that thesis um, that, that Joe is, is putting on the table here. And and I guess I'm gonna I'm just gonna show my bias as the moderator. If it if it is if it is going to kind of swing back this way, maybe not as far as we were in 19, but then start to come back to greater adoption, acceleration, whatever. Like what what do the very e-cares of the world and, and other solutions companies like what what did we learn last year that, that we we can and should get better at and what's going to make a really good partner in the health system well i think what's really important is to understand you know who, there's the multitude of stakeholders in all of this you know the the regulatory environment is huge. And I, I think you started out with that, David, and knowing, you know, I'm, I'm going to promote ATA here. I mean, they've done a tremendous job of really getting out in front and several, several, um, several of us along with ATA really tried to make sure to understand the landscape of what's happening here. You know, right. So as we want to really increase the value of care, well, how do you reimburse that? Well, we're trying to reimburse it in an old model of, you know, CPT codes or, you know, DRGs. Well, that didn't work when it was, you know, used in the 80s and 90s and 2000. I mean, it was difficult. So what are we going to do to recover? You know, you know, I call it the recovery. We need to understand how to pay for value. Um, you know, we talk about value base, but we don't, you know, and, and unless you're in a bundle, you know, there's all the ACO modeling, there's several structures out there, but you know, there's there's the risk involved before you really know, you know, how how you're going to get your performance where it needs to be. So this should be all about, you know, how do we improve our performance in in the healthcare industry across the nation? Um, it, it's been so ridden with how many minutes did I do? How do I code that? What's the right code? Let's put some more new codes in so we get paid for what we do. Well, you know, if we were, you know, if we could start with at least a place um, and it, that allows people to take risk, I'll just use EMR again. You know, there was incentivization um, through that decade of really helping people to take the risk, the financial risk, to go into a better infrastructure for EMR. Remember, we're asking these health systems who, you know, we, we talked about where they are um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, so should they take what they have left um, for resources and, and truly invest in telemedicine, you know, at what risk? You know, how do they understand that? Um, that's a difficult play. They don't know how they're going to be reimbursed for sure and for how long the waivers are in place. That's pretty difficult. Um, should they get into which ACO modeling, you know, to, to really understand the value? Remember, most of the value of telemedicine comes in avoidance of cost. So if you have an earlier intervention, an early visit with the patient that identifies, you know, a potential um, escalation of something going on, you can intervene early and reduce that complication rate. You can take care of them at home. What are, what, what are those models of the right patients to take care at home to never bring into the hospital, whether escalation of, ish, of illness typically gets worse, such as the elder population or someone who has um, little immunity? 
left. So they pick up lots of nosocomial or bugs, if you will, infections in the hospital. So it's really understanding what's what's happening in healthcare. Where where is this tool, um, meaning telemedicine, video, the best use case? How do we reimburse for it, and not just trying to pigeonhole it back into codes that we've used for the last couple of decades, which has really gotten the healthcare industry into tough shape. Now, the other point I want to bring up with here, remember a diminishing workforce. So uh, telemedicine is a workforce, you know, multiplier. We can take a specialist across several states and have them see the right patients. That specialist has the ability to, you know, pick up the right profile of patients and provide the right care, maybe with a clinician that's primary care two states away. So again, really thinking big, deep and broad about this is just a tool for the healthcare industry. It's not a, it's not the total way, but it's part of the delivery model. Just as I spoke, spoke about imaging earlier, there was a time when you know uh, X-rays weren't part of the industry. So how do we engage this and then reimburse it and understand that value model? That's a lot of different variables but I think you can't take one um, without the other in any case. Oh, Joe, this is the first time anyone's ever used the hand raise uh, feature. Was that <laughs> accidental or did you, was that No, strategic? No, I wanted to get Everyone your attention because I wanted to try yeah, and jump in. Yeah, so, uh, I just wanted to teach you a little technology, David. You know, yeah, no, I consider service, myself yeah. taught. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to weigh in on this. I think it's an interesting one. And I'm going to preface my statement with, I can't stress strongly enough, and you heard it from both Deanna and myself, the payment environment is huge in, in how we navigate through there. But the, the other one, and, and then this could either be complementary or contradictory, but we have to decide as an industry, are we going to organize around our patients? Or are we going to organize around ourselves, the docs and the hospitals and the payers and the other part of the legacy industry? And I will tell you, and this, uh, this is gonna sound critical of our industry. It's not of the industry. I love healthcare. My whole career has been in healthcare, but I've heard patient-centric, that term probably a thousand times, sitting around meetings, we're patient-centric, patient-centric, until when? Until it comes time to do process. And then we organize around the physicians, the hospitals, the payers, et cetera. And um, so put that, observation into this environment. Now, I have my own example of using telehealth during this last year. I, it was a day I was really busy all day long. It was, I was on these things all day long. And by the end of the day, I mean, I, something was bugging me in my shoulder and I couldn't even touch my shoulder to the desk. It would hurt like crazy. So I had dinner and it just got worse and worse. And I knew it was infected. Eight o'clock at night, within 10 minutes, I went through my insurer, got a doc on the camera, you know, sent him a picture. He's looking it on the camera. He says, oh yeah, that's infected. And within 10 minutes, the whole episode was done. And I had a, a script written and I, the longest part of that whole journey was driving to, you know, the 24 hour pharmacy to get my, you know, antibiotic cream to put on there. The point being that was organized around me. And I loved that. Now, again, can that become normalized? What does it take to, for something to become normalized and accepted? it takes repetition. It takes both the providers of the care and the users of the care to be more comfortable with that. And that's the question. Can we use this enough where, you know, that repetition, um, you know, become, that it becomes more normalized and acceptable. And well, if it does, then we organize around the consumer to make things easier for the consumer in this situation, then will it, also be supported by a payment environment. And I think that's the question that's, you know, it won't be answered for months, but it, to me, that's what's really important. If we did this, if we do telehealth and we create those visits, but then because we as an industry aren't comfortable with that, so we duplicate the process and say, hey, even though you had this video call, we still want you to come in and see us. Well, then the payments are going to go higher. We're going to get resistance from the payer community. And we're going to be right back to where we were before. If we incorporate telehealth into this entire you know, way that we keep people healthy, then it's going to be an organizing around that consumer. Uh, and it's going to be an integral part of and an increasing part of how we deliver care and healthcare. So that's yeah. kind of how I see it. 
Oh, I think you're I think you're exactly right. To, to get the, the riff you shared a couple of minutes ago about pay, being patient centric. I feel like every conference I've gone to for the last 10 years, with the exception, of course, of all health conferences, um, HLTH health conferences, um, it's all you, you always sit in a keynote speech or presentation where uh, the, the declaration is this is the year of the consumer. Right. And you're like, well, I wasn't last year the year of the consumer. And I'm pretty sure next year is going to be the year of the consumer. Like we keep saying that. And like Joe, I love our industry too. Um, and I, I love the people I get to work with every day. Uh I, and I know you and I have talked extensively about this, so we won't go down some of those roads. Right. But but there there is there are uh, structural um systemic incentives that, that sit in the system that you called out rightly earlier that do kind of keep us from doing the right thing. Right. Um, hey, I love my kids and I haven't hesitated to tell them <laughs> when I thought they were screwing up, right? I mean, that's what you do with something that you that's love. Right. You want to make it better so that it's sustainable. And so when it, what I, cause I can be critical of healthcare and it's because I'm going to call out an industry that I love cause I want it to be there for my kids and grandkids. So, yeah. Yeah. Preach. I think it's, well it's okay to, it's okay to criticize ourselves. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, I've got, I've got two more questions before we, we um, move to just a couple other things and then wind down. Deanna, I, you, you started talking a little bit about, um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest misnomers we still have, and I, I don't think we have it or the people on this call have it, like I, I think we all have done this work enough to know better, but I think a lot of policymakers, consumers, like they hear the term telehealth and they think there's a doctor on a screen, I'm a patient, we're going to have an interaction. And yes, that is a form of telehealth. Uh, but then there's all these other digital modalities that facilitate different kinds of interactions. There's these synchronous interactions, um, things that monitor a patient. Like, anecdotally, I am hearing about this just surge of interest in remote patient monitoring. And I'm just kind of wondering, like, do, do you think there's a, a, a shift, this post-pandemic shift where we are thinking about telehealth further upstream and, and managing chronic disease or prevention. Or am I hearing the wrong things anecdotally? Like, what are are you seeing a, a surge in those areas or other related digital health areas? Oh yeah, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. And and you know, we're great learners, right? So what happened? We in, in here at Avera, um, we had more than a thousand patients a day being monitored at home who were positive for COVID. So, you know, at home monitoring them, you know, uh, oxygen saturation with a finger probe, um, you know, having calls to make sure we could understand where they were and when, if they needed to be uh, transferred into a health system. Boy, that taught the, that taught the general, and we weren't the only ones, you know, across the nation, of course, that was happening. But that taught um, the industry a lot. So first of all, Family members, we've talked for decades, we have to make sure family members are engaged, the patient and family members. So when talk about patient-centric, let, how do we help patients take care of themselves? How do we help patients know more about, well, all of a sudden we have this big population of individuals who were providing care and being supported by family members in their home. Well, part of that was there was no other choice, but they learned from it. We learned from it. Wow, they can do it, that we can be delivering things at home. We can watch them and get some algorithms in place. A lot of work to do there yet, but algorithms in place that let us know um, that someone's maybe getting at a point where they need to be um, transferred into a higher level of care. So is a level of care now going to be at home with some supportive monitoring? All kinds of the industry is super excited about that kind of opportunity for monitoring. You know, we have to be careful. There's a lot of numbers to monitor. You can do blood pressures, weights, um, several different laboratory types of wave testing um, that can be transmitted Bluetooth from the home into, you know, a place where it can be uh, retrieved by the, usually in the cloud, where it can be retrieved by a clinician. Um, so those things are, are so important. Well, how, now let's think that's very patient centric and yet that reduces that cost of care for not bringing them into the ED to make that assessment and send them back home. We're actually earlier in the patient experience and situation of illness so that we can have earlier intervention. We can come back around either by uh, nurses going into the home or even physicians going into the home to offer intervention. Again, that's a big change, you know, that's that's almost not U.S. care, if you will, because we've become so brick and mortar centric, if you will, 
um, many people, you know, even, you know, other nations go, don't all go to the hospital for the kinds of the things that we think about naturally going to the hospital. Remember when people, when you ask people where they get their health care, many of them still talk about a hospital. That's not health care. So how do we, you know, we, I think um, this idea of monitoring at home and helping the nation move in this direction, which really will change um, a lot of perspective about, you know, where healthcare takes place and where sick care takes place. Wouldn't it be something if there's more sick people at home and more healthy people, if you're going, if you will, going to wellness kinds of activities. So this is, these are big changes and that's why it's going to take, you know, it's, this isn't just tomorrow, but I, I think, you know, our younger uh, population of individuals are so much more interested in their wellness. So I, I think you're going, I'm hoping that my children, when, when they need a hospital, it's there but I'm hoping there's a concentration on their wellness and that we give them those resources and they'll take care of themselves at home with some monitoring that helps them know, um, you know when they're getting at risk. Remember right now you can wear a sweat patch if you're an athlete that tells you what kind of electrolytes you should replace and they can come in the mail to you, um, you know, really the right tincture, if you will, cocktail um, for you based on how you sweat and which electrolytes you lose. Think about that for a dialysis patient. So yeah, there's I think more and more monitoring of what's happening in each, you know, each of our bodies um, will really make a difference in our healthcare future. Um, you know, I have nothing to say. That was really <laughs> insightful. Joe, Joe, jump in. Yeah. I no, I I thought it was, it was spot good, on. right? Like, I think we should just show ourselves out. Well, like, so here's so here's the thing that's gonna make that all real is um let me back up. So one of the things that we're talking more and more about within HFMA is this term cost effectiveness of health, not health care, but health. And what's it take to keep people healthy? It's, you know, that sounds radical, but no, that's kind of like the mission statement of almost every health system in the country, you know, improving the health in the of the people in the communities that we serve. So all those things that Dana just mentioned, yes, there needs to be, a, you know, cost effectiveness. There will be a cost effectiveness calculation of each of those but why wouldn't you monitor somebody at home if you can keep them out of the hospital i mean that's common sense the only reason that we wouldn't because it flies in the face of how the economics work in healthcare today and that's the part that's got to change if we really are going to move the needle on um uh, on keeping people healthy uh, you know you you are both um so right, and it's it is I. And there's so much of my uh, my own personal and professional energy uh, devoted to that very subject right now, and I, I won't opine on that. But I'm, um, but I think that is the right frame. And to take it back, Joe, to some of the things you know you said earlier, and I, I think Diana Deanna concurred with um, the, the 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 systemic nature of um, of healthcare in this country just patently uh, makes people do really, really well when we're not healthy. And, and we tend to not do as well when everybody's healthy and flipping that script, like we clearly have the tools to do it, um, but it's how are we gonna prioritize uh, patients and consumers? And do we need to wait for government to make us do that? Um, or do we navigate those complexities that, that I know um, our CFOs have to make revenues and expenses line up or, you know, no margin, no mission, um, however you want to say that. Let me ask one other big question, and I, I think you both will have kind of a key angle to this. Joe, I'm going to start with you. Um, so like most people, I'm sure at the end of most days, I kind of sit down and I say, all right, what are all the emails in my inbox that I missed? And I'll have, you know, five, six, seven pieces of spam. I'm a small business owner, so people trying to sell me accounting services, legal services, blah, blah, blah. And then every few days, I kind of have thought to myself that like, okay, this is annoying, but like, thank God I'm not a hospital CFO, CEO, CAO, because the amount of vendor you know, solutions, emails, those professionals must get, you just have to be astounding. There's so many people playing in this world. Um, Joe, for a buyer, for a CFO, somebody you work with at a health system or just your, your own CFO hat on when you were at Spectrum, like, how do you navigate this just deluge of point solutions that, that can be incorporated and implemented and integrated and those that shouldn't? Like, how do you make sense of the market? Yeah, it's really hard, David. And, and um, I, 
you know, every day as a CFO, I'd have, I don't know how many people would, you know, be pitching me on the next greatest thing that's going to save, you know, my financial in the world. And so, um, and you, you start toning, tuning them out. I mean, it's just too much and too many and, and they all start to sound the same. <clears throat> all the names start to sound the same. This, um, I, this might sound like I'm advocating for HFMA here, but let me make the comment more generally. I got to tell you, um, connections and word of mouth, what I mean by connections, was a product or a vendor used by someone else that I trust? Did my peer have a good experience? And, and I want to hear from my peer about that, because then that would help me sort out the wheat from the chaff. You know, I, I used to get overwhelmed and I would group my emails by, you know, uh, in some way by sender and I would delete, you know, chunks of them at a time because I just didn't want to read all the, the marketing material that came through there. It was too much and you know, I couldn't figure it all out. So those connections that you get through, you know, through how do you connect with your peers? A lot of times that's through associations or going to meetings or going to a health conference or going to an ATA conference or, you know, how do you connect with your peers? And then it's that connection sometimes that can point to the right solutions. Um, it's, it's the current way of word of mouth advertising. Well, I, Dan, I want to, I want to get your, your take on this. Obviously, Avera eCare has, um, you all have grown a lot. I, I, I believe, I guess my thesis on that is that you've done some of those things Joe uh, described in demonstrating impact and, um, and, and having an ability to, um, um, to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. What do you see on the solutions side of the, the world? Like how, how do we get our brilliant, innovative, creative, leading edge in, uh, solutions companies to, to create the kind of stuff we really need in the system and to meet the system where it is. So we do have a more seamless experience. Oh, and you're muted. That is, um, I think. Yep. It's Perfect. not profound, okay? Because this is what we do a lot and it's what all of the companies like eCare do, um, really. So, What's so important for Joe, you know, he, you know, b being the CFO, um, he's got to have a strategic plan. We got to know what is the company, what is the organization, what is the health system trying to do? If you're trying to move every bit of what you currently have in brick and mortar telemedicine, you know, you're you're talking a long time. You got to look because every everything you need to do in telemedicine is not the same solution. You know, we do we do telemedicine coming out of vaults for oncology for um you know mri machines so well, that's not the same technology we're going to use between two to an individual receiving behavioral health services so what is it you're trying to do who are your champions in your organization what does the financial strategic plan say this would be a good place for us to try to have an impact um, on the patients we serve so it's that typical go back where's your risk area what do you want to solve um, what are your clinicians telling you? So the, the, we don't don't go to the vendor first. There's some wonderful vendors out there. We use a lot of them at eCare. Um, the, the point is, is what is it that the clinician group? So my biggest asset, and you hear everybody say this all the time, but, you know, 80% of my spend in eCare is clinicians. You know, it's the workforce. What do they need? What do they see as a solution for their patients? What do they see as a solution set for themselves to make themselves more productive? Listen to them. Sometimes it's hard because they're going to get way out there on the edge of going off the globe with something crazy. And in three years, you'll see it. It'll be out there. So, um, but listen to them. Listen to what they say will make better. And then look for that in, within a vendor. Ask the vendor what they can do and how broad of a solution set do they have so that you might be able to grow into with another part of the organization. It's As you said earlier, there's acute care, there's ambulatory care, there's care at home. We're in skilled nursing facilities. That's different than um, you know an acute care e EICU or e-emergency. So the most important message I can say is you've got to go back to the patient. What can they support in their homes or where they are? And meaning, what can they upload? 
what, how hard is it to download the app, and then listen to the physician and what do you have in the middle for tech to support the clinician in their engineering of you know rolling out that vendor and the patient of downloading you know the app or whatever solution set you're getting. So don't go to the vendor, go to your clinicians and listen to your patients, figure out what they need and how you're going to put a service in place. And Deanna, uh, you crushed that. That was a, that was a <laughs> wonderful answer and in a great in a great way for us to probably. Um, uh, wrap up our discussion today. I, I want to uh, thank you both again for taking the time to, to share your insights. Um, really helpful, really insightful, and uh, I know I got a lot out of it. I'm, I'm sure our, our colleagues in the audience did as well. So thank you both, and Eddie, I will, um, I will transition it back to you to close us out.